10 kilo watermelon. So we had that on the table as well. So yeah, that was a really nice Christmas. People will deliver me fruit. I had a guy deliver 30 kilos. I've been invited to talk in various countries. So I've been to Borneo to give some talks, which was a really wonderful experience. I've been to Denmark. Outrageous, it's just outrageous. If you're going to just eat fruit, you need really good quality fruit. In 31 years, when did you stop? craving it goes on for weeks and just have one type of fruit in more mango trees we're all fruitarian by design i've known people that have done the diet for 20 or more years they've never supplemented with b12 and they've never experienced any deficiencies but other people can get deficiencies after 18 months it's looking at the science this diet needs to be grounded in science everything i share i believe has a good scientific basis behind it i did a 52 day mono orange juice diet water's toxic and it smells and i've known people say well i ate a lot of tomatoes on a fruit diet i have a friend and got he got arthritis as a result and he's very anti-tomatoes. Oh, you're selfish, you're a fruitarian. My name is Ina Lomanov. I interview fruitarians from all over the world to learn about their lives, problems and benefits of this lifestyle. We want to share their unique stories with you on The Juiciest Show. stories on urban fruitarian. Hello, today uh, we're interviewing Anne Osborne. I'm here in New York and Anne is in Australia and is fruitarian for over 31 years now and uh, she's so kind to join us today uh, for this interview and I can't be more excited as I spend the whole week to prepare for this interview and listen to so many of her interviews, read her book and I'm very excited to ask her all the questions that I have for her. Anne Osborne is a known pioneer in the fruitarian movement, been on the lifestyle for about 31 years. She's currently 56 years young, born in Midlands, Leicester, England, and currently resides in Millstream, Australia with her son and Oriental Cat. Her occupations include being a health coach and gardener, as well as fruitarian author and international speaker. And has created an educational book called Fruitarianism, The Path to Paradise, which was also published in Italian titled Fruitarismo le via verso il paradiso. The book shares knowledge, explanation and its own personal experience with living a fruitarian lifestyle. She first learned about fruitarianism at a talk in her hometown by the fruitarian David Shelley in 1990. And from there, she transitioned to eating more and more fruits over the year or so until she got to the point where she was eating only fruits. Anne continues to eat fruitarian ever since. Anne believes that her mission in life is to plant for trees, be kind, and help sentient beings. Anne's favorite fruits are melons, mangoes, Mandarins. Hi Anne, um, welcome to the Urban Fraterian show. This is our second show. I'm very excited to have you. And uh, you are so far away in Australia and you see the time difference I didn't even realize. But it's also a holiday today, right? It's Australian day. Yes. Uh, so do you, do you celebrate holidays in general as a family or yourself? Um, yes, I think we, we do. We do. We celebrate Christmas because as a child I'd always celebrated Christmas and it was always a family time for people to come together. So yes, I always put up decorations at Christmas and I'll make a fruitarian Christmas pudding. And um, you know, usually some members of the family are here, so depending on what they're doing. So yeah, I do celebrate Christmas for sure, yeah. So people come over to your house and, yes. or you, you go? And sometimes we have quite a few people. We've had quite a few fruitarian Christmases before um, where we've had a, people bring fruit and we've had a fruitarian Christmas cake and we've all ate raw, which has been lovely. And I remember one year my father was staying with us um, 
from England and my dad's just on a regular diet and he's like face when he thought he was I said I'll do you a Christmas dinner later dad I'll do you a vegan cooked Christmas dinner but you know we're all eating raw for Christmas dinner but he really enjoyed it you know he really got stuck in and we had a watermelon which we'd grown which was like a 10 kilo watermelon so we had that on the table as well so yeah that was a really nice Christmas yeah and um and Osborne is 31 right years now fruitarian yeah uh, and then vegan even for longer than that and vegetarian for even longer than that. Yeah, so for the first 12 years of my fruitarian diet, I was in the UK, which is a bit more challenging than Australia because Australia really has a beautiful climate and there's so much fruit in Australia. You can get local fruit all year round if you're in the tropics or the subtropics. So, um, yeah, I do appreciate being here, but I still had a wonderful experience for the 12 years that I was in a more temperate climate. It's just different. You have to learn to deal with the colder weather and you have to be organized when it comes to getting your fruit because there isn't local fruit in the, the winter and the spring the same way as there is in Australia. So, yeah, I, I've, I've loved being on the diet in both locations, but it is easier in Australia, for sure. <laughs> Cheers. Well, it's interesting because we're in, like, if you look at the latitude, we're in the true tropics, but we're high altitude. So we're about 900 metres above sea level. So that gives us more of a subtropical climate. And it's kind of interesting because it can get quite cold in the winter. But then that also allows a wide variety of fruits. I think we can probably grow here the widest variety of fruits in the whole of Australia because we can grow tropical fruits like mangoes and papaya and pineapples, but we can also grow stone fruits like plums and peaches and apricots and figs um, as well we can grow. So we have a wide, um, even blood oranges will grow here, which need quite cool temperatures in the winter. So we are very blessed. We can't grow the true tropical fruit here, such as mangosteens or rambutan or durian. But because we're in the latitude where those fruits grow, you just really have to drive 40 minutes down the hill and you can buy durian. So, yeah, we're kind of blessed here. It's a very beautiful climate. And I think the high altitude is very healthy. I think the air is kind of fresh here and you get something that you don't necessarily get in the tropics, which are more sea level. And yes, you have a warmer climate all year round there. You have higher humidity. So you have those true tropical fruits growing, such as durian and mangosteen that need that humidity kind of throughout the year. Uh, but the air to me is much fresher and more, I feel more vital being on a higher altitude. So I do feel very fortunate to actually live here. And I think it's one of the nicest areas in Australia to live. And why did you move there? Was the reason you moved is because you wanted to be in the climate like that? Well, I'd been, or was there some other reasons? Well, we'd been in the subtropics. When I moved to Australia, I moved to the Sunshine Coast, which is subtropical, and it's a similar climate to we are here. And I'd always had the idea that at some point, I'd like to move to the true tropics, and I'd like to move to far north Queensland. And I was always asking people, which climate do you prefer? Sunshine Coast, southeast Queensland, or far north Queensland, because I wanted to talk to people that were on a fruit diet and they'd all say, well, the fruit's a lot better in far north Queensland. Things work out, but yeah, I really, I really do love it here. And you don't really always uh, post on Instagram, so we wouldn't know, but do you travel currently a lot? Like, do you travel the world or you kind of settle the way you are mostly? I used to travel a lot because I work for the Woodstock Fruit Festival. And so I would every year I would go to New York City for a bit, which was great. And my son would go with me as well, which he, he loves New York. And then we'd go to upstate New York for the festival. And also I was, I've been invited to talk in various countries. So I've been to Borneo to give some talks which was a really wonderful experience I've been to Denmark to do talks there and you know I used to go back to the UK when my father was alive regularly to to go and see him so we did a lot of traveling but something I had noticed since moving to Australia I hadn't got the same travel bug as I had when I was in the UK and I think a lot of that was to just get away in the winter. I try and get away every winter to get your vitamin D to get better fruits. And in Australia, it's like 
Australia itself, there's so much within Australia. A lot of people here never travel outside Australia because you've got all the different climates. You've got Mediterranean climate, you've got Tasmania, which is more like a temperate climate. And then you've got the tropics, you've got the deserts, you've got the subtropics, and you can just about grow anything here at some, in some area of Australia, whatever you want to grow or grow somewhere because it's so vast. And there's so much to discover. I don't really feel, if I never left Australia again, I think when my father was alive, it was important to see him every year. But now I just feel, well, I'm happy. And I feel almost, there was one time when my husband was away and I'd got a good stock of food in and I realized I hadn't spoken to another human for two weeks. And I was fine. Oh. I talked to him on the phone and, and talked to my- Silent phone. retreat. But it was like, I'm very happy just working on the land, looking at the wildlife, and I don't very, very content. I, I don't really hanker for anything else apart from just being here, working on the land, watching the wildlife. And yes, I do like to see people, but if I don't see them for two weeks, I just realized oh, I was pretty, pretty happy not seeing anyone for two weeks. Were you interested in traveling for the fruit at all? I really wanted to try red durian and i'd seen pictures like national geographic of red durian yeah it's so red it's so scarlet it's outrageous it's just outrageous and you look at it and you think that's got to be photoshopped and i'd always wanted to try it's on my like red durian. i have it on my screen on my phone like, as my wish list to do yes <laughs> it's always something i wanted and I, i never thought it would really happen and then when we got invited to borneo to do the talks we went to this night market and there was red durian and it was like And it's really interesting because it's not sulfury or oniony or vanillary like most paler durians, but it's almost got a nutty, peanutty taste and the texture is yeah. very different. But yeah, that was, uh, uh, that was kind of on my bucket list and I've done that. There isn't really anything, I've tried some interesting fruits in barley as well, that white mango. And that grows yes. in barley and people have tried to grow it in similar um sort of like climates but nobody I, i think so far has been successful in growing that white mango and i have had that quite a lot in in barley so i'm kind of so do you ever wish that you travel more for those fruits like do you, do you wish to go I, i don't think so because the fruit is so good here and for me variety isn't so I'm, so important as the quality it's always about the quality and i think if you're going to just eat fruit you need really good quality fruit because it's not mm -hmm. some kind of sackcloth and ashes denial it's about thriving and it's about really enjoying it and i i really i don't have that same wanderlust and looking back i was thinking when i was in the uk i think a big reason for me to go abroad was not necessarily the fruit although that was important, but it was the vitamin D from the sun. Because once I lived in the UK, and I lived in the sunniest place in the UK, which is uh, Cornwall, really near Land's End, and it's very sunny there, and in the winter I got no desire to go abroad at all. I was eating imported fruit, and I was happy and I felt very well. But everywhere else I've lived in the UK, I just think I have to go, I have to go abroad. And I think looking back, it was for the fruit as well, but a lot of it I think, was for the vitamin D. Because when you're vegan, a lot of the foods you eat are fortified with vitamin D, so margarine, cereals, milk, that kind of thing. But when you stop eating those foods and just eat unprocessed whole foods, you're not getting any dietary source of vitamin D. And I really do think vitamin D is very important. And I think most people are vitamin D deficient unless they're getting sufficient sunlight because that's the major source. And if I was living somewhere less sunny, I would probably get a vitamin D lamp, the spurty vitamin D lamps, rather than... Yes, you Because I think... Yeah, you're talking about that. You can use it five minutes every other day and you can get enough vitamin D. But vitamin D, when you look at its molecular structure, and there's been lots and lots of scientific studies that show people closer to the equator have lower levels of a lot of cancers. And so the, there's the balance between you don't want to get melanomas, you don't want to get sun damage on your skin, but at the same time, by not getting any sun at all, you can be heightening your risk of other types of cancer like bowel cancer and breast cancer so yeah so i think you know it's it's very important to to get enough vitamin d where in 31 years when did you stop 
craving to travel for fruit or go specifically for fruit where you were content with the fruit that that you have um and, and speak was it right away was it in a year or it was closer to the middle of this time stretch i think once i moved to australia once i moved to australia because the fruit and you could get local fruit and you could grow your own fruit and the whole variety over the course of a year that you could get and you could eat seasonally i really like eating seasonally I don't think we, we should be able to eat mangoes kind of all year round in a way. And we focus on the seasons. And in the UK, we'd get lovely Indian and Pakistani mangoes, which were delicious in their season. But then out of season in the winter, we'd get some quite poor quality mangoes coming in from South America. And yeah, and they were never really good. And I don't know if they've been irradiated or dipped in hot water or treated with chemicals, that kind of thing. So I think just the sheer quality, and it's not always a, to me about the variety, it really is about the quality. I can have two or three varieties of fruit a day, or I can do a mono diet, which goes on for weeks, and just have one type of fruit. As long as the quality is good, and it's been grown in good soil, it's been picked ripe, I don't necessarily, and, and also sometimes here I'll have three varieties of fruit. I'll have watermelon, um, say papaya, and avocados and I'll just have those for a few weeks in rotation yeah it's very natural it makes sense I, I, w I don't feel any desire to travel for fruit I travel for other reasons to see people or to do talks and that kind of thing but for me I'm very satisfied with where I live and I think it is it's a huge difference because with you living in New York and the climate is it's kind of similar to when I lived in the UK and I was always wanting to travel for fruit and for sunshine, but that really did stop. I mean, I'm ready to move to Florida. It's just yes. logistically yes. not possible. Yeah, that's why the winter in Florida, but also I'm not sure I want to be in the Florida in the summer, except the mango season in June, it, but I get it all shipped to New York, so it's still all good. Yes. The question was, so do you grow your own fruits? Yes, and that is that is like a real pleasure. And I. And what do you grow? Well, we're putting in lots of different things. So at the moment, the established fruit trees, um, mangoes, we've got papayas, there's banana plants, um, and there's Brazilian cherries, there's guavas, there's a lot of chocolate sapote trees. So they're established and they're fruit. Um, and there's a few interesting things like cocoa plum, which is really interesting. It's got a very strange texture. And, um, and also groomy charmer cherries, which are established. But we're putting in a lot of trees, so we're putting in more mango trees, more avocado trees, um, more citrus trees, and anything interesting like Relinia or Abu or some of the more exotic things. We're also growing dragon fruit, and we've got some established dragon fruit. So it's kind of a working towards self-sufficiency. And going from working full-time, which was like, say, an average eight hours a day, every day, on a computer which is something I never wanted to do. I was a massage therapist for many years and I started working part-time doing event management, which turned into full-time. And it was something I never thought was particularly healthy, being eight hours a day on a computer, just like physically and mentally and everything. But I think my diet helped me. I didn't get backache, I didn't get eye strain. Um, you know, I, I, I coped with it. But now going to not using the computer very much, and going to working on the land, doing physical work, lugging hoses round or soil or digging and just connecting with the earth for, the, for those hours in the day. And I feel a lot better. I feel more grounded. I feel much less stressed than doing an admin job and which can be stressful. And yeah, so I... Is that why you're not... Is that why... Is that the reason why you're not so... Uh, you're not consistently on social media and you don't really update your Instagram and you're not doing reels. Is that just you're trying to avoid the going back to the computer and the phone screen? Yes, I think just having that break from it. But it's something I would like to do. And I used to do a lot of YouTube videos and I quite enjoyed doing them. So that's something that's kind of on the list. Yes, I'd like to do more videos and also 
videos around the property. We need to show people your garden. Like you need to get it on. I, I want the I want the Wayne to take the camera and, and take you to the garden. I want to see it all. Yeah. But uh, do you share your fruit a lot with your neighbors, or it's pretty much everything on your trees is enough to just to eat? To... Extra, yes. And when um, I had bananas ripe, I was literally just eating from the garden for two or three days because I had enough bananas. And that was really nice. And there were other things like tamarillos and Brazilian cherries and little bits in the garden. It wasn't just bananas. But I thought, how nice it is just to have like two or three days where you're just living off your land. And there's something very peaceful and, I don't know, very nice about it. So yes, working towards that, I think avocados, bananas and citrus aren't so exotic, but they're three good staples because avocados are very high in macronutrients. So you can, you know, they're really good to contribute towards your calories. And in the colder months, they're kind of useful. I think they're a heating fruit. That's a ba the cocktail avocado. Oh, they're so cute. The little one. Often from the Fuerte. The Fuerte variety will have the cocktail yeah. ones on them. It's, it tastes, it's, 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 it, yeah, it tastes the same as Fuerte yeah. variety and to me, right? It's the same. Yes, it's the same tree. And I've picked, there was a neighbor we had that let us pick avocados off his Fuerte tree. And one year, one of the, it's when they don't get fertilized properly. And he had the load of like little cocktail avocados, and that was so so cool being able to. So it's not a separate. It's not a separate tree. It's the. It, it's usually happens. With oh, that's so interesting. There might be other varieties, but mostly it's with the fuertes. And what happens is they don't get fertilized properly, so they don't develop a seed. Cool. They do grow a fruit, but only a small fruit with like a little husk inside where the seed would have been, and it's usually the fuerte variety that have cock yeah no the guy who sent it to me sent the forte and this so i assume that's a different tree but wow it must be like so what do you do you don't pollinate them they don't pollinate correctly or they're not pollinated or they're not fertilized properly so they don't grow a seed but they still grow somewhat of a fruit, but there's no seed. Oh my God, this is so cool. I'm, t I'm gonna be talking about it. Well, that's like, thank you, that's, I'm telling you, I'm just going with the flow right now. I can't even go back to the questions. And how much time you spend uh, a day in your garden I, to, to work on it, or somebody else helps you, well, well, or you do it yourself. It's great, he's really good. So when he's home, he does a lot of stuff, but because he works away, most of the time, it's just me. And the people that lived here before had woofers, so working weekends on organic farms. So that's a scheme by you get people come and stay with you and they work so many hours a day on your garden and you give them a bed and you provide their meals in return. I can be working six, seven, eight hours a day and especially in the dry season and most of that is moving. In the garden. Yeah, in the garden in the, in the watering, is watering because when it's dry here, it can get very dry. And especially if things are in pots, they can need watering two or three times a day. The trees need watering. And so watering, weeding is a huge thing. Weeding is like the fourth bridge. You've never finished weeding because there's always somewhere that needs weeding. And we don't use any chemicals. We're all organic, all natural. And so we don't put anything on to kill weeds. So it's all physically, weeds are physically taken out and composted. And that's very important to me as well, to grow things organically without chemicals, because I think there's so many harmful chemicals that will go into the soil, they'll go into the water table. And it's more physical work. And it's like a balance. A lot of people these days, they think they're too busy to weed their garden. So they just spray on some Roundup. And Roundup is actually the second most toxic chemical, not including radioactive substances. So it's very, very toxic Roundup, but, but the company will say, like, you know, who Monsanto, who produce it, they'll say, oh, it's biodegradable. But then, like, arsenic's biodegradable. Just because something's biodegradable doesn't mean to say that it's not highly toxic. I really do think it's important to be responsible when we're growing things and to, to think of the bigger picture and long term. Short term, yeah. It will save time, but long term we're polluting the environment and we're polluting ourselves as well by by using these chemicals. And do you when you buy fruits when you it's not your own, do you wash them or you just eat I, them? I know like in America they spray all the citrus with, Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, but I still don't wash it, so do you? <laughs> I, I do try to, but I try to get as much organic or non-sprayed. Often local non-sprayed produce can be better than organic because they still do, do use some sprays with organic, but when they don't use any spray, really? it's locally grown and it's still got bits of earth and stuff on it. So I try to get the vast majority. I never buy non-organic bananas. I think there's a huge issue with bananas because I think... Um, the trouble is a lot of people say, well, I peel bananas. They're not a problem. And if I'd had a dollar for every person that said, oh, I peel bananas, it doesn't matter to get organic, I'd be kind of rich. But the issue with these chemicals used on bananas, and when you talk to the banana farmers, is their systemic chemicals, which means they get right into the cells of the banana. So peeling the banana will not remove them. And I, I just think it's a, a huge issue. Some of the chemicals that are used, I don't, I don't eat non-organic or non-sprayed bananas. So I got like 30 kilos of bananas from this local guy. He was just advertising on the Facebook group for the area. And he delivered them for a few dollars more. And there was like, for, for $30, I've got 30 kilos of bananas and they're not sprayed. So things like that, when you're living in areas where fruit grows, you can really sometimes get good fruit, great fruit at good prices. Because for me, the bottom line is always quality. I won't buy cheap fruit if it's not good quality. If it's good quality, that's that's great. You know, that's that's nice, and it's nice to get local stuff and, and you know support local growers as well. Um, but price to me, I don't consider price, and I. Always, I've always had good fruit, and even when I haven't had much money, when I've been a single parent and I've been on a really low income, I've always managed to find good quality organic fruit for myself and my children. So my priorities were good quality fruit to feed my children and myself, and I always found it. I formed an organic buying group so that I could get better quality organic fruit at a better price. So there's a lot of things you can do. I grew some of my own. I had an allotment in the UK, which is a piece of land that you rent off the local council for maybe $5 a year, and you can grow all your own fruit and veggies there. So there's this mm. ways. If you really want to do something, I think with anything, if you really want to do something, you'll do it. If you don't, yeah. then you'll find reasons why you can't, you know, why you can't do that. Yeah. Why you can do it. Yeah, so I think organic or non-sprayed is really the way to go and I think you know looking back it's only been the past maybe 60 years where we've started to use really strong chemicals on the planet so we don't really know the long-term effects of it yes we don't but we we, we see short-term effects they're also there mm. so yep. we just make choices people mm. make choice so you and are the most in my opinion, after especially listening to so many of your YouTube interviews, you are the most uh, media covered fruitarian in the world, I think. I don't think it, it covered more, at least from people that are alive and we know uh, who is fruitarian. How does it feel? Do you feel responsible for the message uh, that you bring to people since many people look up to you? Like, that's a huge responsibility to be, you know, the most popular fruitarian probably in the world, especially in English speaking community for sure. Well, I think it's also important to realize that everybody is an individual. And I always say, because something works for me, it might not work the same for you. And Arnold Eric said, and I've said this in many interviews because I think it's very important, and Arnold Eric was a pioneer in the fruitarian diet, and I really respect his work. And I, every time I read it, I get something new from his books. I've read his books maybe seven or eight times. And he said, the reason most people fail uh, fasting or fruit diets is because not enough consideration is given to individual needs and changes over time. And so I think it's very important when you're sharing information. I'm really happy to share information and I like helping people. And I think that's important because I was helped at the beginning of my journey. People shared stuff with me and I might not have found this way of living, which I feel very blessed to have found if people hadn't shared things with me. So I like to share things with people. But at the same time, I don't want to say everybody should be doing this. This is the only way. I think everybody has got to find their own path and certainly try things. And I think 
we're all fruitarian by design. I very much believe that our anatomy and our physiology, we're very similar to the anthropoid apes. Our dental structure is exactly the same because people will say, oh, what about the canine teeth? But it's more the dental structure, which is not the size of canine teeth, because if you look at the size of fruit bats who solely eat fruit and nectar, they have massive canine teeth and they never touch a piece of meat in their lives, but they have much bigger canines than we do. If you, if you Google fruit bat teeth, you'll like think, oh my goodness, why have they got such big canines? So it's not so much the canines, it's the structure. So the structure of our, our molars, our incisors, and our... Um, our other teeth. So it's the formula. And we have exactly the same placement of incisors, canines, and molars as the anthropoid apes. And that is a very indicative of what we should be eating because most apes, if they're given the chance, will eat predominantly fruit. They'll eat some leaves, they'll eat some grubs. Some chimps do chase and kill animals and people will say well that the chimps aren't fruitarian and they're not strictly fruitarian but they will eat and the surveys that have shown that in if they can get access to good quality fruit they will eat 90 percent of fruit chimpanzees but if they're living in different areas where they can't access so much fruit they will eat more leaves more insects um, more tubers things like that so I think I do very much believe, and nothing that I've read or researched, and I continually read and research because I think it's yeah, like the responsible thing to do. Nobody knows everything. We're always learning, and I'm still really excited to find out more about fruit, fruit diets, anatomy, biology, you know, dental structures, all this kind of thing. Um, so I believe, yes, we've all got this anatomy of a fruit-eating animal, but... DNA changes. So DNA changes with what we eat. And what we eat also changes our RNA in our bodies. So our genetic makeup is changed by diet. And it's changed by what our parents ate. And it's changed by what our grandparents ate. And it's changed by what our great-grandparents ate. So people have different experiences. And one thing is like B12. I've known people that have done the diet for 20 or more years. They've never supplemented with B12 and they've never experienced any deficiencies. But other people can get deficiencies after 18 months. So I think it's very important that you look at your individual needs and that you, if you try a fruit diet, look at what your particular needs are. Do you need to supplement B12? What are your levels? Do you need to supplement vitamin D or get a, a sun lamp if you're living somewhere less sunny? Do you need to eat more greens? Do you need to eat more fatty foods? And always the baseline for me is the quality. If you can't access good quality fruit, I don't think the diet will work for you because you won't get the micronutrients you need. And any diet, whatever diet is, whether it's a keto diet, whether it's a carnivorous diet, whether it's a herbivorous diet, whether it's a frugivorous diet, whatever diet, whatever species, micronutrient needs need to be met. And micronutrients are your vitamins, your minerals, and your antioxidants. I think there's a lot said about ratios, like macronutrient ratios. There's the 80-10-10 diet, which is a lot about your macros. So 80% carbohydrates, 10% protein, and 10% um, fat. But I think it's pretty easy to get your macros needs met on a fruit diet, as long as you eat enough calories. But for me, the challenge, and for any diet, I think, is the micronutrients, because we're seeing that many soils are being degraded. And if the nutrients aren't in the soil, they're not going to be in the foods that we eat. So that's one reason really to eat a lot of organic produce. Did you study, I, what did you major in? Like you, what, what was your major in college? So at college I did um, anthropology with development studies, which was studying third world countries and also did sociology. But I did biology A-level in the UK, which is kind of like the year 11 and 12. And also I did a massage diploma, which was two years and really extensively went into biology um, at a high mm -hmm. level. So I went to a, a further education college and did two-year diploma. Of a, lot, a lot of that was physiology and anatomy. But I also read outside. I've also read a lot of studies, scientific papers, I think one thing that is very helpful with the internet is that you can access so much. You can access studies, you can pay to go on like PubMed and all these 
scientific websites that do studies and you can access a lot of material that previously would be very hard. Yes, you can go through libraries and you can go through universities, but for most people that would be very difficult because they'd have to travel or they'd have to request papers from different libraries, different universities. But when things are put online, it means that we can look at it. So if you hear something, you think, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, I'll research it. Is that correct or is it incorrect? But so I think, yes, it's important to have a basis, a scientific basis. Everything I share, I believe, has a good scientific basis behind it. And I think that's important. But at the same time, I also think it's important that I don't say, I think this is the best diet for everyone. Everyone should do this. I'm happy to give people advice, but I think people need to find what works for them. And it's the same with the amount of calories. Some people say everybody needs you know, 3,000 calories a day but not everybody does. It really depends on your assimilation and how well you assimilate macro and micronutrients in your digestive system. So somebody that's got a compromised digestive system that's had Crohn's disease or colitis or had damage to the villi, which are the little microscopic projections in the digestive system, may need to eat 5,000 calories because they're only assimilate, assimilating maybe 30% of what they're eating. If somebody has done a lot of cleansing, has been on clean diets, has not taken a lot of recreational and allopathic drugs, both of which can damage the villi, they may need to eat 1,500 calories a day because they're assimilating 90% of what they're eating. And I think what I can't really understand is why this isn't publicized more. We're always told you need X amount of calories. And to me, that's half the equation. It's not looking at what's happening inside each individual and why some people need a lot more calories. And also there's things like metabolic rate, percentage of adipose tissue, percentage of muscular tissue, your gender, your age, your activity. So there's all these things that determine how many calories. But the assimilation, what's going on inside your body, you can't say to everybody you need X amount because some people always need more because they don't assimilate as much. Because what the villi do, these little tiny fingers, microscopic fingers in your intestine, they increase the surface area. And the bigger the surface area, the more you can absorb the more you can assimilate. Now, if you've damaged your villi, you won't be able to, as, as the food, as the nutrients are passing through, you won't be able to assimilate as many. Yeah, so I think um, we're talking about assimilation and how it's very important, I think, and I really can't understand why more people talking about how much you need to eat don't talk about the assimilation aspect. And to me, it's just like half the equation. You have to look not just what goes in, but what happens to it and what comes out and what's assimilated. So I think we're all very individual, and I think that changes. And as Arnold Eric said about individual needs not being taken into account over time, there might be a point in your life when you need more fat, or you need more calories, or you need more iron, or you need more calcium. And you may need to change your diet. I don't think you can say, right, well, I'm going to go on a fruit iron diet, and I'm going to eat this, that, and this, and it's going to be like that for the next 30 years. You have to daily assess what you're doing. Is it working for me? Do I need more of this, less of this? How's it going? And I think that is true for everybody and everybody has slightly different needs and everybody's needs change over time. And as you clean out your intestines, you may find that you need to eat less. And that happened to me when I did an extended mono diet, I was eating a lot more fruit, much higher quantity of fruit to maintain my weight. I felt great, you know, in terms of energy, and then I did a 52-day mono orange juice diet. And at the end of it, I just felt fruit's doing me so much more good. And I found I needed to eat about half the volume to maintain my weight. So, yeah, things can change over time. We can start assimilating more through lifestyle and diet changes. And we may need to eat less. So I think it's very important. Individual needs are very, very important. And not telling everybody you should be doing this. People can certainly try things, but they need to find, really need to find what works for them and, you know, tweak, tweak it over time as well. It's not always the same. This was like one of my first questions, but we kind of deviated to different topics. But um, I just want to go back in time and see if you remember your first or your first remember childhood memory when interacting with the fruit. 
Uh, did you like the fruit as a child in general? And do you remember your first encounter with the fruit as a child? Yeah, well, I was very fortunate as a child. From about the age of three or four, my dad had an allotment, which I explained before is something in the UK, probably a bit like a community garden in America. And it's an area divided into lots. You might get half an acre. And they were started, I think, either during the Second World War or just after, so people could grow their own fruit. Because in the Second World War, there was a shortage of fresh fruit and veggies, and people would get scurvy because they couldn't access fresh fruit and vegetables enough because of the war and the shortages. So people were encouraged to grow their own fruit and veggies, which is fantastic. So councils would buy land, they would divide these this land into allotments, and people could rent it for maybe like the equivalent of $5 a year. Very, very cheap to make it affordable to people. Because in the UK, people don't have big gardens. They don't have the space generally to grow their own food. So my dad was had a green thumb. He was very good at growing stuff. And he, we only had a very small garden as children. So he got an allotment and he would grow fruit and vegetables. And in his allotment, he had a green gauge and he called it a Sistem plum, but the sign of the, the general name for it is a green gauge plum. And those green gauges are oh, some of the best fruit. When they're properly ripe, they go almost translucent and golden. And so fortunately, as a child, I had access. He also had a really nice apple tree. So we had these lovely apples fresh off the trees. We could pick the plums off the trees. He grew strawberries and raspberries. So that's my first memories of really, really good quality fruit. And we ate a standard diet, but... My mum would cook most things from scratch. So we had very few processed foods. We had very few additives and things like that. So it was kind of a, a typical meat and two veg, as they call it, diet. But we had lots of produce from my dad's allotment, lots of veggies and fruits in season. So yeah, I was fortunate, I think, as a child to get a love of fruit and have really nice, fresh, you know, homegrown fruits. Who did you want to be as a child? Um if you eat the jet, like, and then any, you know, uh, fantasies of who you're going to be when you grow up, and then can you connect it to what you're becoming now? Is it any way connected? Maybe that fruit garden that you had as a child is connected to how you came well, to this area. When you're kids, you like digging in the soil, and you'd always find old bits of pottery in the soil that you thought were treasure. So when I was a kid, I always wanted to be an archaeologist. And even till when I went to, when I was in a year 11 and 12, the subjects I chose were those that if you, you know, to do archaeology at university. So from digging in the soil, finding little bits, and it was always exciting to find an old bit of a plate. But, you know, as a kid, you think, wow, that's treasure. Oh, that could be Roman, or it could be, you know, really old. So from being in the soil, being in the outdoors, which I think is really important for kids, and I think a lot of kids, unfortunately, don't get that experience today, I wanted to be an archaeologist. That was my thing, and I'd read things about Egypt, and the mummies would always spook me out. I didn't like looking at pictures of mummies, and I, I kind of always thought they should have been left and not dug up. But all the other things about ancient Egypt and the pyramids and the artifacts was like, you know, really exciting. So, yeah, I wanted to be an archaeologist, and now I think... That kind of grubbing away in the soil, that connection with the dirt, is now, I'm not looking for bits of pot, although I still do, I still get excited, oh, maybe I'd find some artifact, but it's more like planting, digging in the soil and planting fruit trees. Um, but yes, I think that was that early connection of just being outside as a kid and bit running around and digging in the soil. Um, and yeah, I still do, <laughs> still digging in the soil, yeah. <laughs> Cool, very cool connection. I mean, it we always sense in the childhood because we have such a good sense of intuition and then it connects. If we actually do what we truly want to do, it connects, I think, in uh, real life. So so let's go a little bit something technical that I want to ask you. So if you go into the big, you know, every time somebody goes on the Google and types word fraternism, it brings them to the Wikipedia page or a summary of the Wikipedia page. And as we know, on the Wikipedia page, the word fraternism includes and implies the nuts and seeds according to the site. 
uh, which is difficult to change, if not impossible, I tried. Uh, so do you personally agree with the definition of the word fraternism, or do you think the word fraternism should refer to diet that strictly includes fruits, and then raw veganism should imply that not seeds and greens and other veggies are part of your diet? Yeah, I think it, it can get difficult when we put labels on things. And a few years ago, I wrote a post. This was when we, that, when MySpace was going. You know, so that's how long ago it was. And I put a post on MySpace about labels and about the fruitarianism label. Because some people are fruitarians and think water's bad. Other people are fruitarians and think nuts and seeds are bad. Some people are fruitarians and think greens are bad. And everybody has their own definition. And when you put a label like fruitarian, it can be limiting somewhat so i would often just describe what i do i eat juicy fruit and avocados because you know when you start saying you're fruit and oh but do you eat this do you eat do you eat that and sometimes i think actually giving a description can be more useful than saying i'm a fruit and you know i eat juicy fruits and avocados because that's really what i do very very occasionally i would eat a greens or nuts and seeds if i make a cake but the majority of the time, yeah, my diet is... And if somebody eats greens and calls themselves a fruit and I, I mean, I just think, again, it's labels. I think it can confuse people, but somebody could call themselves a fruitarian and eat fish. But people are going to really do what they want to do. So if somebody wants to just eat fruit, they're going to eat fruit. They're not going to eat greens or nuts or seeds because somebody else calls themselves a fruitarian and eats those things. Because you could, you could call yourself a fruitarian, oh, I eat you know, 90% fruit and 10% fish or 10% meat. And um, I, I think that's where it becomes limiting. And you can get into all these kind of arguments and it, it takes away from, it takes energy. And I think if somebody wants to call themselves a fruitarian and eat whatever, then who am I to say they can't? It's not my definition, but if somebody sort of says what you eat, I'll say I'm on a fruit diet or eat fruit because that's what I do. But if somebody wants to call themselves a fruit fruitarian and eat other things, I think it's, it's not something you can police, really. I think it gets too difficult, too complicated. Like I know people that say water's toxic and as a fruit fruitarian you shouldn't drink water. Well, I, I think that could potentially be dangerous, especially if you're in the tropics and you do need to have excess water if you're doing a lot of physical work and you're not going to get enough from your fruit. But yes, I can go for weeks and not drink, but when I need to drink water, I'll drink water. So, I, you know, yeah, there's probably as many different definitions of fruitarianism as, fruitarianism as there are fruitarians in a way. So I think often describing what you do can be more useful. If somebody says, oh, what do you eat? I'm on a fruit diet. I eat what, what? juicy fruit. So when you say a word fraternism, what, what you imply into it? What's your definition of fraternism I, I for you, it's for yourself? Fraternism is really eating fruit and maybe occasionally having other things, you know, having maybe greens and nuts and seeds occasionally, having as much water as desired when you feel thirsty, drink as much as you need to. You don't have to have the eight glasses a day necessarily when you're on a fruit diet because your food's 90% water and it's not dehydrating food. So yeah, for me, and also for me, it's always been about the simplicity of eating fruit and not the gourmet raw stuff. I think if someone eats a lot of like raw vegan lasagna or raw vegan pizza, or raw vegan meatloaf or whatever, a lot of people, that's what they want to do. That's not really fruitarianism, that's more raw veganism when you get into the sort of the complex recipes. And because I came into the diet through the works of Arnold Errett and the, this local man I met in Leicester, my hometown in the UK, David Shelley, it was very much just simple mono meals of fruit. And that's how I started. And I've done that. I've never got into the raw gourmet. And yes, very occasionally, if I go somewhere, I'll have a raw gourmet fruit based meal. But it's not never been the basis. And I'm never I don't I get more excited about fruit than I do about, you know, and you don't mix you never mix fruits, right? You like very, very just fruits alone. Yes, very rarely just because I think it digests better if you eat one type of fruit and you have to eat good quality fruit. I heard someone say once, oh, I, I, was, I cut open a melon and it was not very good, so I mixed it with papaya and it tasted good. And for me, like, it doesn't taste good, don't eat it. You wouldn't get a monkey tasting a melon and thinking, oh, that's pretty rubbish. 
they'd just spit it out. They wouldn't mix it with another piece of fruit. So I think when you eat mono, you get better quality because it has to stand alone. You could have some pretty poor quality fruit. You mix it together in a fruit salad and it tastes reasonable because all the fruits are mixing together. Or there's a good fruit in there and it's sort of like hiding the bad fruits. But when you eat mono, it has to stand alone. You only eat really good quality fruit. Like if I buy an avocado, I eat avocados mono and it doesn't taste good. I won't eat it. Any fruit. I've put whole boxes of fruit that I've ordered from organic buying groups on the compost before because they weren't good enough. I think your body is your temple and you've only got a limited space in your stomach. Don't eat anything and, and have an abundance mentality. So it's no big issue throwing a whole box of oranges, even if you paid, you know, like $50 for it on the compost rather than thinking, oh, well, you know, I better use them. Some, they'll rot down, they'll make compost, creatures will eat them, so they'll feed a lot of other creatures. And I think it's very important not to have a poverty mentality on this diet, to have an abundant mentality and to think, don't eat it if it's not good. Even if I paid so-and-so, it doesn't matter. And, and look at what's going in your body and really getting good quality fruit. And you do that when you eat mono. So that's one reason why I, I continue to eat mono because I know I only eat good quality fruit. It has to be a good melon. It has to be a good pineapple. It's got to be properly ripe. And also, I think it takes away, if you've got a really good mango, you can't add anything to it to make it better. If You're right. No, yeah. Really good pineapple. I grew a pineapple recently in the garden and I picked it and I knew it was ripe because the ants start going up and down, up and down, up and down, and it smells. You smell it. A lot of fruits, you know they're ripe. Jackfruit's ripe when it smells. Durian when it smells. Pineapple still on the attached to the plant but it was smelling and you pick it and it comes off easily and that pineapple was just oh, it was one of the best pineapples that i've ever eaten and to add anything to that to me would be like <laughs> just take away from that really beautiful wonderful flavor of it to eat that in a mono meal was for me better than any five course fancy you know fine dining so but that's me you know but yeah yeah, but that's why it's so difficult to, for celebrities who learn about or veganism or fruitarianism to transition because they're just so used to Michelin star restaurants and stuff. And so mm. I personally try to come up with ideas of how to mix fruits to make it that not, not raw vegan, specifically just uh, fruit. But mm. yes, that's what I ask. I, I want to refer, I have a few questions about your book, but first I want to say you wrote an amazing book and I have been reading it this week in preparation for this interview. And sadly, it's not available any longer on Amazon or anywhere else unless you request a personal copy from you and you send a PDF file. So why is it out of print? And uh, the... yeah, and please show the book. Yes, this is the book. I don't have it. Look. Oh, very cool. So that's... Um... And show it to the camera. Show it to the camera. Um, the Yeah, where's the camera? Yeah, like... I think I've got it there. Uh -huh. So yes, so that's the book. Well, I wrote the book. I've been meaning to write a book for many many years and I had boxes of pieces of papers where I had chapters of books and I was like procrastinating about doing it with this and this was 2009 and then um I lived with a cat who was like my soul cat he was just the best cat he was a Siamese cat he'd never scratched he never caught anything he was just really special and he got killed in on the road and I was just devastated and I just thought do something, channel this grief, don't just be sad. And I so made a pledge, I'm going to work on my book every day. It doesn't matter how much I do, but I will work on my book every day until it's finished. And so in the front, it says like, it's dedicated to Monty, who was the cat, and my mum, because my mum was a huge influence on me. And I got finished my book and I decided I wanted to self-publish because I didn't want to have a disclaimer. I thought, I don't want a disclaimer in the front saying, you should go and see a doctor or don't, this is only da da, because I thought, I, don't, I didn't like that. I thought, I have faith in my book or I don't. I don't want a disclaimer. And one of my friends, he was a fruitarian, he said, you should put a claimer in front of the book, not a disclaimer, saying this book may give you good health or whatever. But anyhow, so I decided to self-publish it. And I was living in a place called Nambour, which is in the Sunshine Coast in Australia, and there was a green printer there. So I got my books printed because people said, oh, well, you can get them printed for $5 in China. And I thought, well, I, I'm responsible. I'm responsible for this book. If it's being printed in China, is it being printed in a sweatshop? Are the toxic inks used? What are the conditions like for the people working there? 
I'm not going to do a book unless I know that it's environmentally responsible and the people are having good conditions. So I found a green printer and they printed my book for many years and then they went bankrupt and I found another green printer and then they also went out of business. And I was really busy at the time. I was working, doing homeschool, working an, an average of eight hours a day, every day, like seven days a week online. And I would send the books out myself. And that was also took a lot of time wrapping. I'd like to wrap them nicely and decorate the envelope and send them all out. And I thought, well, I haven't got the time. I haven't got a printer. And I kind of thought, well, I'll just send the PDF copy out. But now I'm feeling more like, yes, I'd like to get a hard copy again. I'm, if I find the right printer, then yes, I will look to do it. Because a lot of people have requested a hard copy, a physical copy of the book. So it is something that definitely I'm thinking about. And now that I'm not doing all the online work, I would have more time to distribute the book. Or potentially find an online, you no know, print on demand, but that was green. So that's another option that I might look at. But yeah, I'd rather just send the PDF out than get it printed somewhere that I don't know what the conditions are like. And because that will have an effect on the environment and the people. And if it's using toxic inks, then I'm responsible. I feel like I'm responsible for that book and I'm responsible for putting toxins into the earth. So yeah, so it's just finding the right printer. And then I would like to would like to get it into hard copy again. Mm. Now, I'll do I'm not going to ask you, I'm going to do research what green ink uh, printer is. Yeah. But uh, I know I've been looking at the, to print my books in um, like not a tree paper, like the hemp or bamboo paper, but it's also, it, it's now available, but it's challenging to find oh, the right uh, company. Oh, we'll be in touch on that. But um, so in your book, you say that avocado is a fruit that's supposed to be eaten in moderation as opposite to like any other fruits. Um, that avocado is not a fruit that you can feel when you're full. You can kind of like eat uh, and overeat on it while like citrus or some other fruits, like once you feel full, you're full and you can go <laughs> past that fullness. Do you feel durian is the same way and uh, why you feel that way? I think durian is, is a bit, and I know people that eat loads and loads of durian. And I think like, yes, you could potentially eat more durian. I think because durian, it's not as high fat as avocado, but it's still much higher fat than your average fruit, which is really low fat. And it's reaching that satiation point. But I think because there's more carbohydrate and there's less fat in durian, it is harder to overeat than avocados but yes potentially you can and since moving to Australia I do eat more avocados but then I'll go for months and not eat them because they grow locally and they're very good quality you can get them without any sprays and the thing is as well what I find with avocados is that you can have a couple of avocados and that's like half your daily calories and it's just easy. I just eat them in a mono meal and then I need to, and I find them very satiating and then it's just the need to eat a lot less juicy fruit. So I often find it convenient. If I'm very busy, if I'm doing a lot of stuff, um, it's just convenient to eat avocados, but I am aware that they do have a slightly different effect on the body. They can be, some people can find them mucus forming. I also find them that they heat me up. So if it's really hot, it's always, like a bit of an issue having avocados it's better to eat them more in the winter because I do notice like a heating effect on my body because of the fat levels but I think that can be useful when it's colder uh, and I, yes I do I know a lot of people that overeat avocados and then they don't feel so good because they're just getting too much fat and they're just not by having and also because it takes up a lot of the calories you know, if you have, say, three or four avocados, that's almost your daily calorie need just in our avocados. And then you don't have so much room for the other fruits that you need. Yeah, unless they're little ones. Right. <laughs> a little, little. I don't even take the big one. Yeah, well, I love durian, but I'm not... I know people, personally, that travel the world for durian. So they travel, so, like, they go when it's in season in Bali, then when it's in season right. in Vietnam, and then when it's in season in Australia, and they will literally travel around the world getting the durian fix. Now, I love durian, but if I never had an, another durian again, I mean, that's okay, you know, I'd get by. And I certainly wouldn't travel around the world. I have said I would travel around the world for blood orange juice with the different seasons, and I probably would, but not for oh. 
So I like durian, um, but like as an everyday fat, if I want something fatty, I have avocados because there's local avocados, they're reasonably priced, they're good quality. And durian to me is more of a treat. And I do appreciate it, I think, because I don't have it all the time. And the Australian durian season is kind of just about to start. It goes usually from January to April when you can get mm -hmm. Australian durian, which is lovely because the other stuff that comes in from Vietnam or Thailand or Malaysia is all frozen and it has to be, I think, frozen for custom regulations to certain quarantine things where it has to be frozen. So when the Australian durian season comes in, yes, you know, I'll get a few and that'll be nice and it's kind of, and it's good as well because you can grow the seeds. So I've got baby durians growing here and it's not really quite the right climate and you have to coddle them a bit and cosset them a bit in winter and, you know, give them a heating mat and put them in a greenhouse. But they're doing so well because it's summer now and, and durians are, they look prehistoric to me when they sprout. So if you can get, if you get fresh durian, you can try growing the seeds. Even if you're in a colder climate, if it's a warm, a warm sort of like house. So with the first durian I had, I had a friend, I, I was living in not a particularly warm house, but my friend had a, a flat that he always kept the heating on. So he took the seeds and they actually started growing because they're fresh and they will grow quite quickly. Um, and they come up and they're really thick and the way they grow is very strange, but they're like little prehistoric plants when they come up. So, um, yeah, so that's what's exciting about getting fresh durian is planting the seeds. So, yeah, I, I have it as a treat, I think, more durian, although um, my husband did buy me some really nice frozen um, Musang King Malaysian durian for a treat a few mm -hmm. years ago. So I did have some recently and that was really nice, yeah. Otherwise, you don't eat frozen, right? Like just, just I, I know I only eat frozen if it's a um, Musan King durian, pretty yes. much. That's oh, it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, because that's the only thing I would like eat frozen. Yeah, and I think having eaten fresh Musan King durian um, in Singapore, there isn't that much difference in quality. Some of the right. stuff is very, very good quality, whereas the Monfong, they can be really hit and miss. You can get quite yes, yes. Frozen. it changes the texture. They're freezing. But changes the texture with Musang King. It's almost like a toffee, like very dense. It f seems to freeze pretty well. So yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I wouldn't, I, I have nothing to compare. I haven't tried the real deal one, but it seems to me that it's very, uh, intuitively I feel when I eat it and that's why I eat it frozen even though it digested my body as cooked food. So I take frozen food as a cooked food. Do you uh, consider frozen food as somewhat cooked, like molecular structure changes and so digestion is? Yes. I, I, I get a hard burn. I think it's different. I also think with frozen fruit, after it thaws, it goes funny. If you eat it when it's slightly frozen, apart from durian, durian's okay with the, the you know, the Mosan King, but a lot of fruit like strawberries, they go all mommy. Um, I think it can have its place. And like with all the bananas I've got, if I have, I don't tend to dehydrate things. So I'd rather personally freeze things than dehydrate them. So I do, if I've got an excess, I will freeze, like I'll freeze those bananas. And if I've got a big bunch at home and it's just me and the, I will freeze them. So I do sometimes have frozen fruit, but I don't think it's optimal. I think it does strain, change the structure. It breaks the cell walls. And I think if you look, and I was like with bananas, when, they, when you take them out when they're first, first frozen and they smell fine, but if you leave them, like a little while, they start to smell not very nice at all. So yeah, I agree that they're not optimal. I, don't, I, I do sometimes have frozen fruit, but yeah, for me, fresh is always the best. Mm. Yeah, no, Musang King, you, in New York you can, it's not allowed to enter New York. I, Australia probably too, unless it's frozen. But you say occasionally you eat coconut. Do you personally consider coconut a fruit? Coconut to me is an immature seed. So when a coconut is fully mature, it'll fall off and hopefully it'll travel away because the method of transportation for the coconut is not an animal coming to eat it. It's water. So very few trees transport their seed via water, but the coconut is one. And that's why you see a lot of coconut palms along the side of the beach, you know, on these beautiful shots of, you know, a lovely beach and the coconut palms. So ideally, the coconut will get to full maturity and it will fall off plop 
and then it will be carried away in the sea, away from the parent plant, so that it can grow away from the parent. So when we pick the young coconuts, and I do like young coconut water, they're immature. So we're kind of preventing those seeds from spreading. And I don't believe that the coconut tree wants its nuts to be picked immature. It wants to, them to be spread by falling off and then transporting and then growing because you can get sprouted coconuts. So some coconuts is actually a sprout and that's what will happen if they're left to mature enough. They'll plop, they'll go further down the beach and then they'll start growing into a coconut palm. So I think that's an issue for me that it's not as ideal ethically as fruit but I do think it can be very useful for hydration and I do, yeah, I do have young coconut water, but I consider young coconut as an immature nut or seed. So it would be in the seed category. I, I don't think it's fruit. And I know some people that are, you know, with their label fruit arrangement don't consider coconut water as part of that. I just do like it. Um, yeah, but it's not really a fruit. In my opinion. Got it. And so are there any fruits that you don't eat, like, for example, tomatoes because they have nightshades, or for whatever reason, there's certain group of fruits that label as a fruit, but you don't eat them because there's certain, it doesn't set with your body, or there's certain labels to it that makes it. I, I'd like to eat, but I can't, is grapefruit. So I've tried this many times. I'll have one piece of grapefruit. I really like the taste but I go to have a second piece and it's like my mouth gets dried out. I can't physically eat grapefruit. I've tried wow. juice, I can't have the juice. It's like a tan in the something in grapefruit. And whether it's a genetic thing, you know, like some people are affected by things differently genetically. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't eat grapefruit. And I have known other people say they can't eat grapefruit. I, I find the taste appealing. I find the smell mouth watering, but more than one piece and my mouth just goes dried out and I can't, I, I just, ugh. Any type or just specific, just regular grapefruit, like a white or green or, or I mean red? Fruits, I've tried the unpink grapefruit. All of them. Yeah, and I've tried it like several times thinking, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe now I won't have an issue, but yeah, I, I can't eat grapefruit for some reason. <laughs> and I think that's a genetic thing because I think other people have that and some people are fine with it, so yeah. Possibly genetic. For, for those years, when did you feel your tongue receptors dramatically change? Was it dramatic right away or it took years? Is it still changing now? Do you still feel the change of your receptors, your tongue, like same fruit but tastes different or even from the same tree? Even yeah. durian is from the same fruit sometimes tastes different. But how you feel about your tongue receptors and how they evolve those 31 years? I think it was pretty pretty quick. I think pretty quick. I think when you start having foods that are highly seasoned or highly spiced and you're just having simple whole foods then I think it's pretty quick I think pretty quick I was noticed I was satisfied when we started our buying group and we were getting really good quality fruit in the early days yeah I was very satisfied and I, I was like really amazed with the quality of the fruit right at the beginning when I started my journey so I don't think it takes long I think when you start you know not having in your diet foods that have excitotoxins in or foods that have, you know, sort of monosodium glutamate or flavor enhancers. And they are very, that very unami flavor that is very stimulating, I think, in a way. So I think when you stop having that, yeah, your taste buds very quickly get adapted. I don't think it takes long. So yeah, it was pretty quick. And something else that is, is not like related to the fruit diet, but related to the vegan diet. Now, when I became vegan, I noticed very, very quickly that the smell, I didn't taste it mm. because ethically I became vegan, so it wasn't like I was gonna taste dairy, but the smell of dairy, and I love cheese. I was like, it was hard for me to give up cheese. Yeah. I loved it. But within a couple of days of giving up dairy products, the smell of cheese was too strong and I didn't like it. And also, um, when I became vegan, it was again a couple of days after I gave up animal products and I tried a trail mix and the trail mix had carob buttons in it and the taste of the carob button was really strong and off-putting and I rang up the shop and said, do your carob buttons have dairy, any dairy products? And they said, yes, they have milk powder. So that was a few, only a few days 
and I was not fruitarian, but I was vegan, and I was having, you know, some processed vegan foods. It wasn't a hugely clean diet, but it wasn't too bad. And just a couple of days, my tongue told me, oh, oh, that's not good. I don't like that. Even though I'd loved chocolate and I'd loved cheese, within a few days of stopping having that, yeah, I was very, very aware of it and not liking it. So that's kind of, I, th I think your body responds pretty quickly. I don't think it takes a long time. That's good. Yeah, no, it changes. It's, you can, you can say it. it's, it's, it's exciting. People say, okay, this fruit is not sweet to me, but it is mm. sweet to somebody else. So how important, uh, you think on this? It's like a two part question is like, do you have a lot of fruitarian friends that live nearby or you communicate every day? And how important to successfully transition to fruitarian diet? to have a surrounding of people that are in the same lifestyle or it's impossible if your husband or your kids are, you know, not fruitarian, is it possible to do? If you, all your friends are not fruitarians, can you do it? Or it's important to have that uh, support uh, from your surrounding? Well, I think by the very nature that many people um, aren't, you know, there's not many fruitarians, it's, it's very unlikely, unless you live in a fruitarian community, that you'll have a lot of other people on a similar diet near you. I was particularly fortunate because when I started out, it was because of a talk by a fruitarian guy, David Shelley. And there was a whole group of us at that talk. We were all ethically vegan and we all decided to become fruitarian. So we had this social network. We had a whole group of people going through this same thing together. Plus we formed the buying group. So we were accessing really good quality organic fruit. So I think I was very fortunate with that. I think most people don't have that, but I think that's where the kind of the internet comes in, that people can connect. Because I think unless you're, you know, you've got fruit and friends nearby, which is, you know, pretty unlikely, it can be important to connect on the internet and that can be good for support and I think this was why the Woodstock Fruit Festival was started initially by Michael Arnstein because he saw people connecting online and he wanted to bring people together and that was always you know the whole thing of the Woodstock Fruit Festival being in an environment with you know hundreds of other people that think very similarly to you and eat very similarly to you was just like always oh, such a, a, a like it recharged your batteries it was wonderful and I think all the fruit festivals I went to were like that because as I moved away from Leicester, I've never really been part of a fruitarian community since then and it's always been online connections. So once or twice a year, going to the fruit festivals for me was like, you get your battery charged up and then it would almost last till the next year till you saw all those other people again, that sense of community. So I think community is important. It's not always possible. Um, face to face. So I think then when it comes in, you know, getting in, in touch with people online, sort of joining groups. Um, Facebook's got a lot of fruitarian groups. So people can ask questions because a lot of it is people wanting, well, I'm doing this and I'm having this side effect or should I be doing this or what do you think of this? And then people can reply and say, well, I've done this or I think this. And, you know, and then that person can just think, well, yeah, well, that, that's a good idea. So I think it is important to have community. I think a lot of people um, can also benefit from just reading some of the good books, Arnold Eretz works, Morris Crock, Essie Honorable, because they're very inspiring. And I think if you're having a challenging time because you're the only person doing this diet that you know, just reading other people's experiences, you don't necessarily have to go online, but I think if you're not online, then books can be your good friend and they can help you. And, and inspire you and think, yes, I resonate with this. This is, you know, this is what I'm going through. Or, yes, I totally agree with that. And I think the other, the other thing you asked about the, the family, I think that can be challenging. I think for me, um, you know, my husband, he's a vegan, but when I met him, he was just on a regular diet and I never pushed anything on him. He's very supportive of the fruitarian diet and he would like to do it himself. Went. Yeah, and I think it's being open to, I think your partner or your family don't necessarily have to say, oh yes, we want to be fruitarians, but if they're open and supportive. And it's like my husband, when I first met him, um, and I'd always cook vegan for him, and but I wouldn't say, oh, you have to be a vegan. And he was like, not, 
not so interested at the beginning, but then more and more he got aware of things and he became aware of the, the ethical side of it. And he's now been vegan for quite a few years now. But it's, you know, it wasn't pressing it on, on him. But by the same thing, he was very supportive of me. So he wouldn't eat meat in front of me. He wouldn't eat animal products which I thought was very respectful, and I really appreciated that. And he was always open to the diet and supportive of it. So I think you don't necessarily have to have people in your family that are doing the same diet as you. As long as they're supportive and respectful and open to what you're doing, um, otherwise it can be very challenging. And I think what other people have said to me that they find challenging is if they're changing their diet and they're having to cook for their family or there's other foods in the house. And I think that's when it can be challenging at the beginning of your journey, if you're just transitioning into a fruit diet and there's foods that are tempting you because you can smell them or you're still cooking them, I think that can be challenging. And I think that's when we need to look at our own needs and think, yes, well, you know, my family's needs are important and I want to look after my family and I want to give them good nourishing food, but also my needs are important and working out things, maybe having someone else cook in the family and making sure you've got plenty of good quality fruit and finding something that works until you get to the point where you don't see cooked food as your food anymore. And so like, you know, I, I cook, I don't taste it, but I cook. And some people prefer not to cook for their family, but I don't have an issue. I like cooking. I kind of like the creativity of it. Um, and it means that my family eat good quality vegan food rather than takeaways or junk vegan food. So you have to find what works for you. And you also, I think it's important to look at your own needs as well. Yes, your family's needs are important, but so are your needs. And if by getting someone else in the family to cook for a bit until you are comfortable cooking, then, and I, I know fruitarians that won't cook for their family, and I think that's fair enough. And I know ones that do and don't have a problem with it. But it's working it out, and I think being respectful to the other family members, not trying to push things on them, and communication. Communicating with anybody doing non-violent or compassionate communication can resolve most family issues. It's amazing. I use it, I've used it at work, and I use it with friends and um, with my family, especially having teenagers, you know. But, yeah. Is it, is it the most... Is it the most um difficult part of transitioning to fruitarian lifestyle or what's the most challenging part do you think in transitioning um, well, to this lifestyle for you what was for you the most um, challenging I, d I don't remember any particular challenges really because after meeting David Shelley and seeing how good he looked and thinking this starts really working for him and accessing really good quality fruit which was a lot more delicious than most of the vegan food I'd been eating and I didn't find it difficult, like I didn't have any major elimination because I'd been gradually refining my diet. Ever since I discovered the vegan diet and realized that it, it improved my health, even though that wasn't at all the reason I adopted it, I'd been refining my diet and I'd left out, you know, white sugar, white flour, processed foods. So there was this gradual move. I don't think it was a huge, big thing for me. By the time I was ready to go on the fruitarian diet. I'd already changed my diet a lot, so I think that helped. I, didn't, I got cravings a few times for vegetables, but I did a transitional period, so then I, I had you know, cooked vegetables in the transitional period, but then at the end of the transitional period, I didn't feel a need for them, and I felt better the days that I just had fruit or the weeks I just had fruit. So I didn't really notice, I can't say that I noticed any challenges. I've always been a person that's been a bit different and not been afraid to do my own thing. It's like when I was a teenager, all my friends smoked. When I was at uni, all my friends smoked dope and I never did because I just thought, I don't think that's healthy, I don't want to do it. So I've never been a person that's, that's been afraid to sort of be different to everyone else and it's never bothered me. I've never thought, oh, I should smoke because all my friends are smoking. I should smoke dope because all my friends are smoking dope. It was like... I don't particularly want to, so I'm not going to. And I didn't mind. You know, they do it. I didn't care that they did it. That's their thing. But so I think I've always been a person that's been a bit different and not minded being a bit different. And so I think with the fruitarian diet... Different and crazy. Yeah, it was... <laughs> I love it. 
I didn't feel social pressure. I just thought, well, this is what I'm doing this. You don't have to do it. You do your thing. I'll be happy for you. But, you know, I'm doing this. Yeah, so I've not felt social and pressure. Do you feel like everything you do in your life, um, like do everything you wanted to do in life, you're doing, or you still have some dreams and inspiration to do more? If so, or what it is? Well, somebody once said you can do everything you want in your so life, but not at the same time. And I think that's brilliant. What is it? If you're looking after kids and doing continuum concept attachment parenting, you maybe can't necessarily write your book or do this. So yes, I think you can do everything, but not at the same time. So I've been fortunate. I like always kind of thought about living in far north Queensland and working towards self-sufficiency. So that's come into fruition. One thing I would really like to do that I've wanted to do for years is to do a mosaic. So I wanted to do one when I was in the UK and I found someone selling mosaic tiles secondhand and they were really cheap. So I remember my sister went with me and we got off the bus with these like bags of mosaic tiles, lugged them all the way to my dad's and I don't know what happened to them, but anyway. So for years I've wanted to do a mosaic and so now I'm here and I feel like, well, this is a place where I want to be for a long time. I've got a load of mosaic tiles again and I'm really excited to do a couple of mosaics. So I've got a couple of books I got from a library sale on how to do your mosaic. And I've got ideas in my head. So that is something that I would like to do. I would also like to do another couple of books. Um, do one on my fruit art. I did lots of fruit plates when my younger son, for about a year, every morning I'd make him. Like a, it could be a picture of Mickey Mouse or a dragon or a sunflower. And I'd take a picture of it and put it on Facebook. And people used to really like the pictures. And then he'd come down and he'd have his breakfast. Um, you know, he'd have a different fruit plate. And it was all fruit, 100% fruit, but it'd be different pictures. I'd like to do a book of that. I'd like to do a book on child rearing. So there are things I would like to do. Um, and a mosaic. But yeah, I feel pretty fortunate that I'm kind of living the life that I really wanted to live for a long time and, and finally able to do that. So yeah, I'm pretty happy. But I'll send you the name of the book. You, you, it'll resonate with you, I'm sure. Um, I have like I'm, I had a lot of questions, but we have a little time left. I think eight minutes. I want to kind of wrap it up at um, two hours. So, what's the meaning of life for you, in short? I think the meaning of life is um, that we are part of this planet. That we are connected to everything, everything on the planet, plants animals, other humans, and that what we do can be effective for the planet or not so effective. So the actions we do, whether we're kind, whether we cross with someone, has a different type of effect, whether we um, put chemicals in the ground or whether we put compost on the ground. So I think that we're, everything's connected and everything we do has an effect. And I don't like to say wrong or right, good or bad, but it has an effect. And that, that we, we sort of like, as we maybe evolve and we get older, we can see more that all our actions have effects and that it's, it's important to be kind. I think it's important to be kind and important to be grateful as well for our blessings and realize that everything's connected. And while there's people that are homeless or while there's animals that are suffering in laboratories, we can't say that, you know, everything's perfect. And I'm still aware of that, even though I think sometimes my life's perfect. There's, there's things happening. I think, you know, and, and while there's, you know, in, in my own country, while there's people that are homeless or people that are suffering, then we still have to look at ways, how can we heal that? Just because we're all right, it's not just about us. But it is our needs are important as well. So, yeah, I think that we're all connected and that every action we do has either a positive or a not such positive effect and be very aware that every, every, everything we do is important and we can help. And sometimes we feel helpless because you see all the things going on in the world. But every little thing you do, whether you just smile at someone or whether you do a kind action, whether you take a spider out of the bath, you know, everything can, it contributes. It's not, you don't have to do the big grand gestures all the time, every little thing. I think it's very important for the harmony of the planet. And uh, with the fraternism, 
slightly starting to trend again. It seems like when you started, there was some sort of trend, then it kind of went down, and now it's trending back up. And you know, because of social media, mm. people get to know it quicker, much quicker, and then connect to it. Do you see? Where do you see? Where do you think the world will be in 10, 15 years, specifically the future of fruit eating? And where do you see your role in its development? Well, I would like to see people taking more responsibility for the planet, people um, eating more plant-based, um, people realizing that what they eat affects other creatures, affects the planet in terms of organic or plant-based. and environmentally using less being aware that we don't have to have you know the biggest car or the latest of this and that and being more mindful of the the impact that we have and using less using less energy buying secondhand clothes um that kind of thing and i think because a lot of people are doom and gloom oh this planet's screwed and it's going to be destroyed but i i don't believe that i think if enough people become more conscious and the more people become conscious and I think things are changing and I think a lot of kids are very aware of environmental issues and they you know they really want to do something and I think one thing is that children do have more of a voice now I think years ago children were seen and not heard and they weren't allowed to speak up but I do think children are more able to speak up so I think there's that faith in children cherishing the planet and I think hopefully in 10 or 15 years, more people will be taking personal responsibility for their health and not thinking the government's going to save them from a pandemic or whatever, but that they can save themselves by working on their immune system, on their mental health, their you know, community, um, relationships with other people, spiritual health, and that we have got a lot of power and people reclaiming their power and not saying, oh, we're going to rely on governments to save us from this or that, but it's, it's us that will do it. And health is a big part of that. And the more, I think, the more fresh, whole organic fruit and good quality produce we have um, and growing things without chemicals, that, you know, I think we could have a, a really well functioning planet and we could feed more people because somebody once said to me oh you're selfish you're a fruitarian what about children starving in Africa and you'll just want to eat fruit but the thing is planting fruit trees is the most effective land of use use of land so if we say planted an acre of banana plants we could get something like 24,000 pounds of food if we use that area for beef we get 150 pounds so Fruit eating is a very effective use of land. Fruit's much more effective than planting vegetables, even like potatoes or carrots, in terms of calories and nutrients per acre. So I think if we're using more land, and also if we're farming organically and planting trees, we're improving the soil structure, we're improving the microcosm of all the fungi and little microorganisms in the soil, which is all you know creating this beautiful soil under the trees. So I think there's potential, there's enough potential to feed everybody in, in the, on the planet if we grow more fruit and more organic produce. And yeah, people don't need to starve. I think it's shocking that when we produce enough food, there's, that children starve to me. So hopefully in 10 or 15 years, children won't be starving, we'll be feeding everybody and people will be taking more personal responsibility for their own health. Thank you so much for the interview. <laughs> it was, uh, oh, I still had a lot of questions. We might do, need to do part two at some point, but um, thank you again. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you today. And I feel very honored that um, you've chosen to have an interview with me. Thank you so much. And I feel so honored to interview you today. Thank you so much, Anne. It was such a great time. Ah, <sighs> <laughs>